looking at CU Learn course design and aesthetics. So it's, this isn't really um, instructional design more or less as it is changing the look and feel of your CU Learn. So we're going to look at a bunch of different examples. Uh, and, and we're going to have a quick look at a bunch of things that you could potentially do or options that you might not have known about in CU Learn. So uh, I'll quickly talk about what course design is and, and what to be mindful of when you're thinking about your course and, and ways to, to modify things. Uh, as I said, we'll look at a bunch of examples. Uh, we'll talk about branding and consistency. We'll look at uh, where to get images, uh, how to edit or change the font, where to bring in, uh, how to bring in colors and where to get different colors or color swatches. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about mobile users. So, so a good workflow is easy to explain and communicate to others. The best workflow doesn't need any description at all. So some courses, uh, I'm lucky, I get to see lots and lots of different instructors and lots and lots of different courses. Uh, no two courses are created equal. Uh, everybody has different things they want to highlight in their course. And uh, some are very elegant and clean. Others are kind of a hodgepodge. And if I was a student in that class, I'd be struggling to find what's new and where I should be going to get specific content for different things. Um, so we'll have a look at uh, mostly great examples. Um, so there's some buzzwords uh, that we'll throw out there today. Uh, things like uh, color, organization, branding, images, responsive design, uh, different graphics. Is it flexible? Is it engaging, enjoyable, reliable? All these sort of things. So uh, we'll look more specifically at elements of these when we talk more directly about how they apply to, you, to your course. Um, the next couple slides go over a bit of a framework to look at uh, sort of the user uh, experience when they come to your class. What is it sort of, uh, how is it outlined? What, uh, what things come up when, when we think about how the user interacts with your course? So the first one is recognition. So think theme or process or content. So this is uh, how do they instantly know what to do, where to go, or what to get? Uh, so access, are they looking at it on, on uh, their computer, are they looking on their phone, are they looking at it with a group of people potentially uh, or, or in group work? Navigation, so how does the user know how to get, a, get around? Are things grouped together by like or grouped together by, uh, by, by topics or weeks? So do they know where they need to go next in the course after they've just looked at, a, at a, either an activity or resource in the course uh, without getting lost? <clears throat> Consumption. When, where, and how will they be accessing this? Are they, are they doing it on the bus? Are they doing it at home? Are they doing it in class? Are they, are they doing it uh, for their own uh, benefit at home while they're studying? Then when are they actually using this console? When are they extracting information from this? Are they doing it during assignments, during, a, during uh, uh, review? When are they actually taking the content that you've provided there? Is it for bringing it to class so they can take notes on top of it? Is it for uh, synthesis and... and, and uh, development of ideas for different assessments and assignments in the course. How do they take that content and where does it actually get used? So communication, uh, how do they get notified about uh, new content that shows up in the course? Um, do they get feedback on things they've posted? Do you allow them to give feedback to you? So where is the communication or, or conversation uh, with your course? Some people just uh, have a an online course discussion where students can ask questions and other students can answer, um, which is nice because you only really have to step in when something goes off the rails and students can kind of make their own little community online and you really only have to monitor it uh, a bit. Reporting. So reporting is important for you. You want to know how students are, are actually using the course uh, and they want to know how they're progressing in the course. So a lot of times when we see reporting, we, we think of grades. So how how are they doing in the course at this point with grades. You can also go and look and see when was the last time the student accessed the course. You can quickly get a list of say, these 15 students have never accessed a course, we're three weeks in the course, they've already missed an assignment. You can quickly send all those peop people an email and be uh, ask them to either well, come to class or, or, <laughs> or download the notes or, or why they aren't participating in line. Uh, potentially the way your course is set up may not require them to, to log in. They might uh, have all the information they need from the textbook and you might just be putting uh, extra resources up there. So it might not be necessary. Thank you very much. Yeah? Did you say that uh, you can also see how many times they've accessed it or is it just the last time? Uh, no, you can see the last time and you can see how many, how many different times. So we can look at reports in the class. You can see 
a uh, whole plethora of things. There is another recording uh, on the EDC website about analytics. So there's a whole bunch of different reports you can look and you can see either as a class or as an individual student how active they are or what pieces of content or activities are getting the most views and the most usage uh, and what times, of, what times of the year, what times of the day. So I love my LMS and it makes it easy for me to learn said almost nobody ever. So we use CU Learn. It's, uh, it's based on something called Moodle. It really doesn't matter. Other institutions uh, that you may have uh, worked at or, or, or been talking to might use Blackboard or Canvas or Sakai or Angel. There's a whole bunch of different learning management systems. There's no perfect learning management system, otherwise we'd all be using it. But it's a pretty fair split and we're on one of the biggest ones. Um, and we, we try to keep it current every, every year by upgrading and bringing the newest tools that you want, but sometimes that also brings a bit of headaches. But we are in a very um, forward-thinking learning management system, and it does a lot of things uh, like responsive design. So what responsive design means is we design a website once, it works on a desktop, it works on a mobile phone, it works on a tablet. So no matter how you're looking at it, it's going to scale down and fit or look nice on, on any device. So uh, that's one great thing that the, the web services and CCS team has done uh, with, with this branding of our learning management system. It works very well across different platforms. So course design uh, is good design, something everyone knows how to do. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, we all have different, um, different strengths. Uh, we all come to the institution and teaching from, from dairy, very different backgrounds and for dairy, with very different reasons for teaching. Uh, and instructional design isn't something necessarily everybody knows how to do. Uh, luckily, the EDC is here, so we have lots of instructional designers and, and there's lots of educational technologists and uh, uh, educational uh, consultants that you can come and talk to about your course if you're interested in, in something that isn't working or something you'd like to change. Uh, we're always here and always happy to have a conversation about anything related to teaching. Uh, even stop by, we have coffee, so we can just stop by, say hi, and grab some coffee. It's not the best coffee, but uh, it's free. So whose job is it? Um, unfortunately, it is kind of your job to become aware of uh, what your students need to help them succeed. So already by being here, you're already showing that you, you care about uh, your students and you want, want to help them learn. So how does that extend into your course design? Uh, so your online course is really a home away from home. So it's up there 365, 24-7. Students come to class for about three hours a week. That's, uh, that's about 4% of their entire week that they might actually be studying. So uh, it's a very small time that we have with them. So we want to make it easy as possible for them to get that uh, uh, time with the content and be brushing against your information. Uh, so does you learn foster good design? Uh, potentially, maybe, maybe not. We'll have a look at, at, at the way CU Learn is, is set up and, and, and the thought behind how that uh, actually works. And, and we'll look at how we can actually improve the student experience. Um, so CU Learn is very linear. It's very long. So if I have a look at a course here. So this is our, our basic default empty course. Uh, so our content, uh, for those of you who haven't seen so you learn before, this is just a blank standard course. This is what you would get the first time you ever entered a course. Down the middle, um, it gives us these things called topics and it, it wants you or it suggests that you sort of lay things out uh, sort of on a step-by-step -step fashion. So whether these be weeks or topics that you're going through, ideally we sort of go top to bottom and move through the course and through the material. Uh, there's extra stuff on the side. We'll talk a little bit more about these later. But these are called blocks. Uh, they take up about half the screen, so they're, they're kind of important. Uh, you can get rid of them. You can change them. We can, we can add uh, different things in there, and we can edit them. But um, C Learn's really set up, and they want you to sort of funnel through this learning path and work your way sort of from top to bottom. That's the thought behind it. Um, so... We can change these topics, uh, as I said, into weeks. We can group these either by our, our topics might be all of our readings, all of our assignments, all of our lecture slides, or it could be week one, week two, and have the dates, or uh, module one, and in there we have our, our readings, our slides, our assignment, all for that one week. So depending on your content, the way your course uh, breaks apart, or, or, or the length of your classes maybe even, uh, some people tend to chunk things 
sort of by what they're able to cover in class. Um, so we can change all that and we'll have a look at, look at some of those examples in, in just a second here. So we have our topics. Think of it as a self-contained space to add content and context. So content are things like our, our, our slides, our readings, so uh, our resources, and then our activities. So discussions or assignments or quizzes or, or different things like that. Uh, so in our topics, we're able to divide content, and then we want to use some sort of context. So whether it's just the name of the week or a bit, uh, a bit of a description of what the learning outcomes are for that week or, or how you would like them to use this piece of content or, or use this uh, assessment or assignment. Uh, an extra sentence or two, adding it in a couple places can go a long way to sort of let the student know what you're thinking by, uh, by putting the course together in this, in this fashion. So we're just going to go through and look at a, a whole bunch of different courses ranging from uh, your sort of standard fare. Um, so here's an electronics course. Uh, the instructor has, uh, they're only using about five different topics here, but you can see it's very linear, very uh, content heavy. Uh, so 70-ish percent of people using CU Learn are, are just sharing content from there. We see people do things like have discussions, have online assignments, have online quizzes, uh, have online course feedback. Uh, but for the bulk of it, a lot of people are using it sort of just as a content sharing system. Um, more resources, less activities, but that is, is gradually shifting, uh, especially with more people doing more of a blended approach or an online approach to learning. So <clears throat> here we just have different, different topics. The instructor, the instructor didn't even sort of rename them. There's not extra uh, text anywhere, sort of describing how somebody would move through, but it's still uh, very linear. People can sort of see week two, three, four, five, six. It goes top to bottom. A common complaint with Moodle type courses is this scrolling. So by the time I get to the end, it's a scroll of death. You're just kind of, every time you get in the course, you're scrolling to the bottom. There's a few different ways to combat that, and, uh, and we'll look at those as we look at different courses and, and different options. So here's another course. Uh, this instructor has some general content in the top. They've uh, lumped all the assignments together. Uh, they've added some extra text to, to let students know sort of what's expected in, in different areas. Um, and then they've gone on to, to sort of have the title for each class and, and what's involved in there. So this already makes a little more sense. The students uh, can kind of see what's, uh, what's coming and where they've been. They remove some blocks to remove some clutter that they, that they feel they didn't need. So again, focusing the student back into where they, they feel they want their content. Uh, this instructor has added an extra Twitter feed block on the side. Uh, very easy to do. Um, they've uh, added some <coughs> Uh, latest news information on the right here. Um, they have a little picture and contact information so a student doesn't need to go and, and look at the download the course outline. Uh, they have a general course uh, forum. And, and then again, it, it's based upon on weeks and, and classes within those weeks. Um, so things with icons are, are the resources or activities in the course. And uh, again, gets sort, of, sort of gets very long. Uh, added in a couple images here and there. Sorry, yeah. Twitter feed is, are those links posted individually or is that just uh, mirroring a real existing Twitter? So this account? one is, is, is uh, getting a feed from a real existing account. So uh, whether, it, whether it's a, a Facebook post or a blog or, or a Twitter feed, you can take that feed um, and just drop it right in the course. Okay, so, any other courses here? Let me add it. Hmm. So yeah. So any Twitter hashtag or feed, you can make a make a a, a form out of it. Here's the uh, here's the president's course that she's teaching this upcoming winter. Uh, so. Um, very simple, just added some uh, different color and style of text uh, to bring the, bring the, the course together. Um, labeled each week as well as the dates. Um, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible for the student to work their way through the course. Uh, here's our blended and online teaching program. Uh, so again, some custom colors, some custom menus. Um, 
some some general content at the top and then we have it linked into into different sections so some extra text and between the, the different learning modules uh, something like this uh, doesn't take a lot of time you just change the color and the font a bit and you can drastically change the look of the course uh, again here the instructor just uh, added a uh, an image to the top and we changed some of the, the font color and sizes in this course uh, these are a couple courses that are uh, sort of in the same stream, so they, they wanted the similar sort of look and feel to both of them, so we uh, just made the, the header look sort of the same, and then they, this instructor is using something called uh, tabs, so instead of having that scroll of death, um, we have different tabs that uh, students can click on and see the content for that, uh, and we'll look at all the different options available to you, but this is something called tab topics. So you click on one and then it'll show you the, the content for that as opposed to having to scroll to the bottom to find something. Uh, let's see here, where are we? Uh, you can embed videos very easily, whether that's um, YouTube videos or something that, that we host for you. Uh, this is another type of uh, course that uses, it's called the grid format, it uses icons. So if you have a, a big course uh, this is a fully online site course, so what we did was uh, when a student clicks on this, they get to see the content for that week, as opposed to having to scroll down uh, to something else. They sort of just click, they can see, click and see. Um, and instead of having every sort of file, uh, every sort of resource, every sort of video, all the assignments and all the quizzes, are put in something called a lesson talk a little bit more about this later but but what a lesson does is if you think of your course is very long this way what a lesson does is let you sort of expand it on the side so we can add in different things like um, can we go back to the pictures yeah so say I pick one of these pick a lesson and then students I'm in the instructor view but students Oh, this is an empty one. Let me pick a different course that actually has stuff in it. Uh, let's see if... Okay, so um, you can add buttons to have them go through. You can show them different content. Uh, we're in as an instructor, so we see a bit of extra stuff, but uh, it's basically sort of just giving them a slideshow, but you can Im embed quizzes and other things and, and sort of spoon feed them the, the content throughout it. So this is a lot more involved, and we tend to do these for our, uh, our fully online courses because it does sort of reduce the amount of content um, that we have on our homepage and it lets us sort of structure what they get to see when they get to see it and we can build in assessments as they as they go through uh, things that you'd potentially be doing in class uh, again here's just another communications instructor that, that use a different sort of style and different pictures and their icons um, uh, again here's another one this uh, an online class being taught between four different institutions um, you click on a section and it brings up your content. This is another type. Uh, this is called the collapsed topic. So we have our same topics, but if you click on it, it expands and contracts. Um, so it's called a collapsed topic. Yep. Do you have a website, a, a site? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this, uh, this, this generic electronics course. Under edit settings for your course, it's, uh, it's what's called a course format. So under course format here, right now it's a topics format. So we could change it to a weekly format, let's say, to start with. We'll go through the other ones as well. So before it used to say topic one, topic two, topic three, topic four. Now it actually automatically puts in the weeks for the different courses. So if you know you're going to want a week-based course, uh, very easy to change it to that. Uh, let's go and have a look at 
one of the other formats. Um, you could also have weekly reverse format, so that puts the, the other way around so that uh, if you're building content sort of as you go, it keeps the newer content sort of at the top. Um, collapsed topics is that last one you looked at that was at uh, that business course there. And uh, there's a bunch of different options so you can hide some of these buttons and toggles but again uh, it's just a click and you can change back and forth. Uh, so these, the colors and, and the toggles and different things are, are editable. With uh, in this format or other formats, you can also hide a full topic. So maybe you just want to sort of spoon feed your students the content. What you can do is you can hide these so they're only seeing the, the current week's material. And maybe um, you'll be bringing this to the top or, or moving a topic down um, when it's done. Yeah. Sorry, could you uh, so we'll have a look at a different format. So it's under edit settings. Yeah. And then just below the description there's, a, there's an option for course format. And under format, uh, we, we looked at uh, week, we looked at tops, um, collapsed. Tab topic uh, is another one. I just choose that. Unfortunately there isn't a lot of options with, with color and, and whatnot for this one. It's, it's, uh, and the tabs are based on the, the size that you turn editing off here. So um, by default it gives you one to twelve. If you were to change the names uh, in one of the in one of the sections, so let me turn editing on. We'll come in here and set a topic one. I'll call this uh, say readings or something. Save that. Now, you as an instructor don't see these tabs because it'd be uh, just the way that the development works when you're an instructor and, you're, and you have editing on and you're changing stuff, it doesn't show you that, that tab. So if I turn editing off, we can see that, we can see the title changed to readings, okay? And we'll have a quick look at the couple of other topics here, edit settings, course formats, there is a social format. What's this, what this does is it replaces everything in your course uh, with just sort of a, a blog. So you, your course page no longer has topics. Uh, don't worry, it's not going to erase everything that you have. Uh, you, can all, you can always go back in a second later, but basically uh, you can change the text up here and uh, potentially put in, say, the course outline or some other things, and then everything else shows up as a blog post or a discussion post. Uh, and when you're making a discussion post or you're editing any of these sections, whether it's a discussion post or, or you're editing something right here, you can add files. Um, um, not a great example. Uh, oh, that's what I was doing wrong here. Okay, not a great example. Let's see here. Okay, so say I wanted to share my syllabus. Um, we can always attach a file uh, just by making a link to it. So if we click on link, instead of putting in a URL to a link, we would just say browse repositories and then we could upload a file from our computer. Um, something on the desktop here. Um, so potentially depending on how you want to run your course, uh, maybe you're just saying here's a content for this week, here's a readings, here's an assignment. Uh, you post it up and then you can just post it to the course homepage and, and off you go. Uh, I'll show you the last option here. Oh, I need to go back to the homepage. Edit settings and course format, grid format, and so grid is the one that's icon based. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different 
sizes and shapes of icons you can choose. The default is square, about this size. And then um, you can just uh, click change image below it to, to add in a picture. And you just upload whatever picture you like. Ideally, try to put them, uh, try to make them about the same size and shape so you don't get weird boxes and boxes or, or um, it just looks more visually appealing if they look the same. I'll show you an online image editor that you can use and where to get some good images in just a second. Uh, so questions about the different course formats? Yeah? Can we change format of individual lectures or just be for the whole course? It has to be for the whole course, unfortunately. So um, all the changes we were making there really affected every topic. So um, yeah, unfortunately there's no, there's no way to, to sort of have it. Uh, you can potentially have a topic uh, in the regular format, hide it, and then just use a picture up here and link to it. So you can make your own custom menus up here by having a picture, another picture, and then um, you basically, in fact, make your own menu to jump, jump down to different sections. Um, back in our PowerPoint. So that was a whole bunch of different courses. So we looked at the grid, course topics, tabs, social, wiki, or weekly, and, and again, to, to highlight a week. Um, so that right now, week one is highlighted, or readings is highlighted. You can change that and, and highlight the different section or, or week that you're on. Blocks, okay, so um, we, we quickly saw Twitter. There's a couple other things happening in the blocks here. Let me just hop over to a different course. And okay, so this one, they uh, uh, a whole bunch of Sprout courses decided to brand them all very similarly. Um, so a lot of the business introductory courses look like this. Uh, they put their logo at the top. They all have the key dates and stuff on the side. Uh, key dates is a very popular thing. These people put the evaluation for the course up there. Uh, so whether, if it, whether it's different resources that you want them to see, different information that you potentially get emailed or contacted about a lot, putting it right on the home page uh, is an easy thing. Potentially the, uh, the contact information we could have put over there as well. If you use forms in your course, uh, you can add a, a block to say um, search the forms. You can add blocks that do things like uh, link to other support services on campus. Let me just go back to our empty course here. When editing is on, everybody gets these default blocks. But there's a little gear icon uh, on each one, which you can use to uh, either delete them. So I'll delete that block there. Or this little plus sign where you can sort of drag them around. So maybe I wanted my recent files above that or, or I didn't want something else. Down at the bottom left, you can add different blocks. So uh, there's an attendance block, a calendar block, anything that you say you're doing online assignments or quizzes or different things like that. Any due dates that you put into the system will automatically show up on the calendar. It'll also show up under those important dates upcoming events. It'll also show up on our up upcoming events. Um, you can see engagement analytics. So this would let you as an instructor see who's, who, who's least and most active in the course. HTML block would let you just put anything. So anything that you want to embed from a third party like uh, a Twitter feed, like a Facebook, like a, a blog posting or anything like that, you can, you can usually embed in the HTML. Or you can just uh, add any Thing you like, whether it's a quote, whether it's a picture of yourself. I just clicked add new HTML block. By default, it puts it down on the left-hand side. You can drag it wherever you want to put it. Oh, let's drag it up here. And you can edit it just by clicking on the gear icon once it's done doing its thing here. Hello. While that's happening, again, we have uh, the eyeball here so we can hide something. Or we have the uh, oh, unhide. 
or we have a little light bulb to sort of highlight that so that it highlight that week. It's a nice visual representation to let students know sort of what's going back. So back on the HTML block here on the side, and just make that bigger so people can see that easier. Click on little gear, configure new block. Uh, some, some fancy title. And then you can put in pictures or images or, or a little video or important dates or anything that you'd like to have on that block. So it's just another option for you to, uh, to have. You can remove all the blocks uh, on, on the right side if you want. You do need to keep this administration block, otherwise you won't be able to change settings or look at grades or, or do a couple of other important things. So uh, whatever you do, don't delete the administration block or um, it's going to be a pain to put back. Okay. Back in PowerPoint here, custom menus, instructor, contact information, important dates, resources. Uh, so there's a whole plethora of things you can put in your blocks, but it'll depend on, on what's important to you in your course. Uh, we need to think more about the cake and less about the icing on top, even though it's the icing that attracts us to the cake in the first place. So making it look pretty is all nice, but we, we want to make sure that we think about the structure and the content and, and what we're actually sharing with the students and uh, in what order and will it be beneficial to them. So some, some simplifying content, less is more. Uh, instead of having a super long page, think about uh, bringing things together either in a folder if they're just a bunch of files or uh, chunking contents in the books or lessons. Uh, think about accessibility, so post in, in web-friendly format. So if I'm accessing the course on my phone, I might not be able to view a Word document here. So potentially if you're putting it up, uh, you can put it up as a PDF or you could put it up um, just as a page in C-Learn. You can just copy and paste from Word into uh, a page in here and it would just make an HTML page that a student can access uh, on any device. Manage the view, so we talked about showing and hiding. Uh, you can hide a whole topic or you can hide a specific piece of content or activity that you've uploaded. Uh, and you can create custom menus up at the top to, to help link your way through the different course. So where do we actually start with thinking about changing our course? So think about the content, how you want to organize or structure, whether it's by type, whether it's by uh, topic, whether it's by module. Then we'll, we'll think about colors, what color or image really defines your course. And then we'll, we'll look at the font sizes and shapes and, um, and color along with those to match the images. And then what other media potentially will you be bringing into your class? So a little more on that. Uh, so images in your course. So since the last option, or since last upgrades to C-Learn, you can actually drag and drop images right into the, the, the browser. So let me just go and... Cool. So let's search. Biology images. So something I want to show you here, uh, just because I'm already looking for an image, when you're doing a Google image search, there's this button for search tools. Under search tools, there's something called usage rights. So when you're taking an image from the internet, you can always uh, make an attribution to it. Uh, a lot of times, um, the content on the web is somebody else's intellectual property rights. So when we're going and taking that and putting it in our slides or putting it in our course, uh, it's best to know if it's, it's, freely, it's freely available to reuse. So I can cut down my, my searches by saying labeled for reuse. Now there's a bunch of pictures and anything in here I know I can just take and, and just put, put right into my course. So um, these are all fairly big. Let me change the size down to something smaller. Okay, so let me just drag that onto my desktop here, back into my course. Yeah, so I just saved it to my computer uh, just so that I could show you if you already have images on your computer, you can just drag them into the browser here okay. and it'll automatically add them. The other way to add images to your course is to click on this little image button. Uh, it'll take a second, it'll finish uploading. If you, Sorry, you just drag it? You just drag it into... In, into the so right now I've, uh, I'm 
editing a topic. So yeah. I click the little ear icon and you can just drag it in or you can click on this button to, to uh, browse and find a new one. If uh, you, can, you can leave this auto size button on, what that'll do is, um, let's have a look here, another course. So what auto size means is if a student's looking on this on a smaller device, uh, I didn't leave myself enough room. It'll automatically resize the image and it'll automatically resize the, the text. So the image will resize based on, on sort of who's, who's looking at it. Um, and then another thing to be mindful of here is alignment. So default is bottom. So what does alignment mean is if we start putting text here, if we want the text to be sort of beside the image, if we click on the image, click on the little icon, and we say left, it floats the image off to left, and then we can sort of go and put more stuff here. You can also resize the image in here, so it'll change it. So maybe I want to make it a little smaller, so 200 instead of 275. It automatically resizes it. Now, it's fine if you're just doing sort of small changes, but don't go putting four megapixel pictures in there and then resizing them down. We want to resize them outside in a different program, and I'll show you very quickly simply how to do that uh, in just a second. The reason for this is if you have a bunch of images on the page, it tries to load the full size image. So if I'm looking on this course on my phone, it's trying to download that gigantic image every time a student hits the page. So be mindful of, uh, of what you're trying to push into the student's browser. Okay. Uh, so I'll say save. We're back in the course and we can see the, the image is there and it's floating off to the right. Um, so drag and drop Google. So there's a bunch of different websites to find royalty free images. Um, public domain image resource is a, uh, is a really good one. I don't know if this, it wasn't working earlier for some reason. Okay, Pixel Bay. Pixel Bay is one so it has royalty free images that we can go and take. Uh, and, in, and we can see this is in the public domain. It says it right here, public domain, so you're free to download it. You don't need to put any attribution uh, or save where you got it from. There's a bunch of different other websites like this. Uh, so there's Pixel Bay, uh, publicdomainpictures.net, free images. There's a huge list of these on, uh, oops, let me just go and. So if you just Google, Wikipedia public domain images or just email me and I'll send you the link. Oh. So it's just a huge laundry list uh, of different websites. So there's Wikimedia Commons. Uh, so this is Wikipedia public domain. So, uh, jellyfish. So I know instantly all these pictures, I don't have to attribute anybody. They're in the public domain. They're free to use. I can print it. I can do whatever I want with these, and I can share them, and I, I don't have to worry about somebody potentially coming back at me for, for copyright infringement. Um, and again, there's just a whole bunch of different websites like this. Uh, there's a lot of public domain stuff, so stuff that's over 50 years old from older books uh, that have been scanned in and is in here. Uh, there's newer sites like uh, we had a quick look at, at Pixel Bay there. Um, so uh, lots of different pictures, images, things you can you can take and use. Uh, there might be something more relevant uh, to you. There's the British Library has millions of images taken, uh, mostly from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century that you can take and use. Uh, just some. Fun, fun things in there uh, might be relevant for you, might not. So there's uh, lots of easy spaces to go and have a look. What's that? Public domain. Public, do public domain. Net. Yeah. Uh, there's also something called Creative Commons. So there's public domain P. There's copyright C. In the middle, there's something called Creative Commons. So this is somebody that produced a piece of content. Maybe I took a picture and I can upload it online and I can say anybody can use it. You just have to uh, 
credit me, so put a link underneath. Or anybody can use it, you just can't make money off it. So arguably, it'd be usable in your, in your, in your lecture material. Um, so I could do something like uh, search, let's search Flickr here for biology was working for us before, so let's have a look. So here's a bunch of pictures. Um, let's find one that's not a dissection. And I can click on it. I can download the different sizes. Some rights reserved. Uh, so if I click on that, you can see, so share, free to that. They just want you to attribute it. So if you're using it in your course, ideally, um, you would uh, copy this person's uh, Flickr account and just put it underneath or put it in your put it in your course resources or, or put it in the bottom of your um, slides or something like that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different websites that let you see if this will work now. There's free stock images. There's some of these different websites that uh, Uplash, Gastrology. I'll post these slides online so you'll have all these links and I can just send you a, a listing of these links after as well. Um, these are high quality stock photo websites that uh, either release a few per day for you to use to do whatever you want with um, or they're all completely free and a lot of time it's, it's mostly still life. Some are organized more by uh, uh, what they are or are fully searchable but there's a lot of free resources out there to find images online. Um, oops, let's go here. So editing images. So pixlr.com is uh, an online application and it's uh, sort of like Photoshop. Somewhere between Photoshop and Paint from, from back in the day. So uh, you can very easily add images um, open image, so I'll look at my desktop, I'll find that picture that I dragged on there, and I can do different things uh, like draw over it, put text over it, change the color. Um, Sorry, what's the name that you said? So it's pixel R, pixel R. So I can change the image size to a different size if it's a really big picture. This other website also uh, lets you do this very simply. So it's free online photo editor. So super, super simple. Um, so basic stuff, like I want to resize it. I want to make it, there's even a slider. I can make it sort of smaller, apply. And then it would let you save it as a, a ideally if you're putting it on the web, it should be a, a .jpeg or .png file type so that it's easy for, for students to, to access or easy for any, um, easy for any computer to, to change. So potentially if you're making icons for your course, you can come here and uh, very easily uh, reduce the file size of different things. You can uh, change the, the saturation or make them all Safina looking. Uh, so if you're trying to get that brand or identity in your course, you could have a bunch of different disparate images, but by applying a filter or something like that, you, you sort of bring that visual representation back into your class, whether it's uh, potentially even pixelating things. Make it look pixely. So there's a lot of different tools. Uh, no one expects you to be a, a, an image expert. Um, and if you have problems, stop by, we can chat for a couple of minutes, or, or if you're trying to do something with your course, uh, email or stop by and we can have a look at, at what you're trying to do and uh, what program might be the easiest for you to use to, to do that. Uh, so don't scale up, never make a picture bigger than uh, you see it or you downloaded it. Um, do scale down, if it's a really big image, make it, make it, make it smaller. Uh, for those of you that don't know pixels, so those that 200 or 700 numbers that we saw, they're pixels. So that's the number of little pixel bits you'd, you'd see across the screen. Uh, for example, the standard Carlton website here uh, is about 1024. Um, and there's about 600 pixels in between this space here. So if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. Uh, just sort of 
try and make things a little smaller if they're gigantic. Other than that, really shouldn't be a problem. HTML doesn't have to be scary, so uh, the editor in CU Learn is meant to be as simple as possible and to work on as wide-ranging devices as possible. So from iPhone to Android phone to whatever, there's not a whole lot of options. There's the first button you can click on and uh, you get some extra, extra things going on there. You can also at any time go to, let's open this here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different online editors. This one's called Best Online HTML Editor. So you don't need to know any HTML, um, but you could either copy and paste from Word. A lot of times it takes the formatting from Word. So if you can make it look nice in, in Word or Word Perfect or whatever you're using, uh, you can copy and paste it and, and retain a lot of that formatting. Um, for example, let me just take this, copy, paste. So maybe I wanted to make this a different color for my course. These colors tend to be atrocious. We'll look at where to get new colors in just a second, but let's pick something um, like that. Maybe I wanted it a different font style. So by default, we don't really let people change this type of stuff um, in the course. Georgia, let me make this bigger. Maybe you wanted to make this text gray, so it only takes a couple seconds of sort of monkeying around to get a bit different look. Um, and then you can copy and paste this. You can copy and paste this back into here, and it keeps all that, that formatting. So. Um, just a simple change in font color and size uh, can really change the whole look of your course. Uh, some people will go through and change the top of each topic just to be a different color to give that student that, that visual representation uh, of moving through the course. Uh, try not to use more than three font sizes and styles combined on a course, otherwise people will start, it just looks, visually doesn't look right. Um, so try and stick to three-ish sizes and color, like a combination of, say, one big purple, a smaller normal size, and maybe a third accent color size sort of thing. Um, try to use sans serif. So that's uh, just, if I go back here. So these are serifs, uh, like Times New Roman, and uh, we have these extra little things. They're a little harder to read. Kind of nice for headlines that tend to be bigger, but for smaller text, we really want to try to do uh, something that doesn't have those on it. It's a lot easier to consume uh, in, small, in small print. Alrighty here. So there's something called Cooler or color.adobe.com. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different websites for um, creating swatches. You can even just Google color swatches. And um, let's see here, explore, most popular. So quickly we can come and see, we wanted a couple colors from our course. You can even upload an image and it'll pick colors out of that for you to use. Um, so you can have a look at it, you can change things, uh, and then you can get these numbers at the bottom, which is what you need to be able to put into uh, into something like like this here. So if I change the color, I'd say more colors. You'd put that number right in here, and then you'd be off and running. So if I did this here. So that didn't seem to work. Ah. I have to have a pound sign in front of it. There you go. Okay, so uh, very easy to find colors that complement each other. Try to only use a few high contrasting color. Uh, you will have colorblind students, so we want to make sure that um, they're at least high contrast, so they can they can see the difference between the two. It also uh, it makes it more visually appealing when they're higher contrast. Yes. Um, if you do that and select a certain color, mm-hmm. 
So it's not going to change it for all of them, and that has to be done individually. But what you can do is you can sort of copy one, paste it on the next, and then change the wording, paste it on the next, and, and change the wording. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you put in a background picture into that first block? No, you can't. So, uh, so the question was, can you put a background image into that first block? So you can't per se. I could put in a background color if I made this, say, a table, one row, one column with 100%, and advanced, so we'll just make that, and then table properties, no border, no spacing, no, 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 no. and I'm supposed to be able to do color here, where's color? Hmm. Maybe it's under cell properties. Border color, background color. So you can do a color. And then we just dump everything in here. But can't really do background images. Uh, and depending on what you're trying to do, you might be better off hopping into one of those image editors and, and putting the text right on the image itself. Uh, so that you always get a consistent, a consistent view. Other questions, comments, concerns, accusations, threats? Excellent. So uh, we talked briefly about uh, mobile users. So about 20% of our, our people hitting CU Learn. So CU Learn uh, per month gets about 1.5 million visitors. Um, so People tend to uh, anywhere log in up to 30 times a day to once a week. So it uh, depends on who they are, what they're doing, how much they're accessed, how neurotic they are. 15% um, of people are on a mobile device. Uh, another 5% are on tablets, but the tablet number and mobile number has been steadily increasing over the last uh, few years. So when posting your content, think about how or when students might be consuming this, this content or media. Um, it might be an extra step for you to, to post your, your PowerPoints up as a PDF, let's say, as opposed to PowerPoint. Um, a lot of times students can potentially find a way around looking at their content, but uh, just be mindful to try and make things as, as simple as possible. And remember, this is your, your home away from home um, for your course, so feel free to put different uh, resources up there. Students are new to the field. They might not know where to get good information. So even uh, instead of even just putting uh, a Twitter feed in your course, you could link to here is news for biology from biology today. Go and have a look at what the recent stuff is. Uh, you might already be talking about some of these things in class. You can go up and put the links in there in there as well. Yeah, and there, there lies a rub. So now if you make a change on something, then you're making two files and stuff again. So um, for PowerPoints, I probably just post a PowerPoint. For, but for different Word documents and things like that, a lot of times I'll just post the, the PDF. So good question. Uh, so we only have three slides left. We're a couple minutes over time. Thanks for, for sticking, sticking it out here. So a couple, a list of don'ts. So don't create a glorified file repository. So just one massive list of, of files is going to be uh, a little nauseating for the students. So potentially even try and group things together. Or uh, one thing we didn't talk about is that you can indent and, and outdent in the course. Um, so beside each file or activity, let me just add up another file here. Uh, under the edit button, you can move right or move left. So you can indent and sort of make a, a repository or, or file structure in the course. Try and keep file titles short. So the shorter the better. Don't be afraid to have more negative space. So it didn't need to be uh, course design. It could have just been course design and see you learn. I didn't need to necessarily put the whole title there. Depending on what you, you label your files, it might be better to have shorter, shorter uh, titles. 
Um, don't over clutter your course with too many blocks. Students really won't know where to look. Don't flood your course page with too many graphics. So pictures are great, but use it sparingly. They're, they're meant to be evocative and, and to either link with the content or, or, or to be linking with, with a thought that, uh, that you want to have in mind for that area. So putting too much up there um, might detract from the statement you're trying to make. You don't use too many different colors or fonts. Uh, don't overdo the content and activity names, as you just said. Don't be afraid of white space, and, and don't forget to have fun with it. So if this is your, your course, it is sort of a branding of who you are. So students, most instructors use you learn. So if students are looking at four or five different courses per semester, it's nice to have a bit of a visual identity so they know what course they're in uh, and sort of identify with you or your course. Um, takeaways, clarity is key, uh, brand your course, potentially make a little style guide for yourself. So if you are going to um, potentially change the font and color, uh, try one out first, uh, see if you like it, and then you can save that either in a Word document or on another page, uh, or just in that first block, and then you can copy and paste it to the rest. Uh, try and be consistent with, with sizes and, and colors and, and, and shapes of images. Um, Try to create a learning pathway, so make it uh, intuitive for students to, to link uh, the different content or, or activity pieces. And uh, try and improve flexibility where you can. Uh, try it out on your phone. Uh, just take a look at your course. You might see something doesn't look right or, or, or it looks different uh, than you thought it might. Uh, there's a bunch of different events coming up at the EDC. So there's real-time testing uh, with Turning Point and Poll Everywhere. So these are student response systems. Uh, there's a multiple choice retreat, so learning how uh, to write it, um, uh, good multiple choice questions and good distractors. Uh, there's, a there's a community engagement in teaching roundtable coming up. Uh, there's Capture, so the screen recording device that I use to record this session. There's another session on that and how other instructors are, are using that in their courses. And, uh, and then teaching students to use instructor feedback is another one happening. So all these are happening in the new year. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and we hope to see you again if you, at 